Thank you, Jacob, for the shake. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the 50-minute hour is the line. Casa de Blanco. Say the line. Say the line. Say the line. Give the people Hello, what welcome they want. to the 50-minute hour. Hey. Yeah. Uh, we're back. This is Corey. Today I'm joined by uh, Jacob, uh, Seraphim, Calvin, Howdy. and Nate. We were originally going to do a podcast on the topic of apocatastases and uh, universalism and... Uh, Ramelli and the early church and David Bentley Hart. Um, however, <laughs> it's a really good shake. And, and hermeneutics in the Old and New Testament. But uh, we were going to do this with a scholar friend of ours from a New Zealander friend, Samuel Watkinson. But uh, alas, he uh, had some third world New Zealand problems and was not able to join us tonight. Internet went out. So we're going to substitute with a long awaited episode on the aesthetic judgment of milkshakes. Or one milkshake, apparently. Of one particular milkshake. The White Castle Chocolate Milkshake. It's been hailed the best milkshake by many. Jacob can attest to that. Yeah, so how this started was uh, the good old boys at, uh, what's it called, New Tech. Uh, Don't know if you all remember Jake Kaler, good lad, before he got up and uh, got the old ball and chain on him. But uh, he's married now. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so the guys at New Tech were insisting that uh, the best chocolate shake in the world is at White Castle. And Christopher Naughton, their boss, was like, well, that can't be true. So he begrudgingly went to uh, White Castle and uh, he was very angry when he tried the chocolate shake because sure enough, it was the best chocolate shake he had ever had. And I heard this story and I thought, well, like Calvin and I should go try it as well. And last summer, he took me to White Castle and he got me a chocolate shake. And I just kept getting them because it was so good. It was the best chocolate shake I'd ever had. And so I'm I'm very happy to bring them to you today to test on air. So without further ado, I'll put the straw in your mouth, Corey, and start sucking. <laughs> we'll all do this together. Okay. It's so a communal suck. So oh, yeah. Okay, count down. Spit it out. Spit it out. Like Nate, you want to count? What, what am I supposed to count to? Just three, three two, two, one. Okay. <laughs> three... Two, one. Okay. That's a good shake. Wow. That is that is a good that shake. That's a pretty damn good chocolate shake. Corey, thoughts? Um I don't I don't really like chocolate milkshakes. If I order a milkshake, I usually order a malt vanilla shake. Um and so it's very difficult for me to judge this because I don't have any reference to the actual flavor aspect of the milkshake. So I, I'm not going to be able to judge it on the aspect of its chocolacity. But I guess I'll say the texture, it, it has a very good balance between the smoothness while also retaining the crystallity of the structure of the shake itself. Um, but... I I still have a much again without any regard to flavor, I have a very strong preference to the malt aspect of the milkshakes I've had, which would be more like what I've had at say a Steak and Shake or Culvers or Freddy's, um, or even like homemade milkshakes. Um, so I can't, I can only give such a. Um, particular aspect of the judgment only in regard to the texture and in that aspect i can't say it's the best milkshake i've ever had but it, it's definitely but is it the best chocolate milkshake you've ever had it's the only chocolate milkshake i've had so it is the best chocolate milkshake <laughs> yes. you've ever had and here you have it folks thank you for joining to the 50 minute hour the best chocolate milkshake Corey has ever had i think for me what really does me in with the white castle shake is uh the texture is perfect in my opinion it's just enough to where you have some suction on the straw but um it's not hard enough to where you have difficulty um it's very chocolatey interestingly we found out white castle only produces chocolate shakes you can't get any other flavor shakes not vanilla it. not vanilla wow. like they legit do not make vanilla shakes and they I don't, don't do just, malt variations. they don't do malts either i think that's just because they feel like they've mastered their field or whatever and that's about that i will say that um one problem I usually have with milkshakes is that they are too thick, which I know is a quality that a lot of people 
really liking their milkshakes, but usually it takes it's a struggle for the first few minutes to actually drink a milkshake, which is very frustrating. Um, and they do, like you said, I mean, it goes down very easily, but it's not like too watery. Like it sits in your mouth for a minute. So I, I think that they did a very good job on the on the texture there. I really do like the simplicity. No whipped cream on top, no yeah. cherry, no other flavors. You go, you say, I want the chocolate shake. You get a chocolate get shake. A chocolate nothing shake. more, nothing less. And it's the best chocolate shake you've had. It's not the Sonic, Wendy, uh, you know, jalapeno, Dairy Queen bacon, bullshit. all yeah. that. Yeah. Just a chocolate M&Ms shake. M&M's and... And Corey, for someone who said it, it's not your favorite, you keep... You keep Going back and I taking see you more. Drinking that. He's going between a beer and a chocolate <laughs> well, milkshake. It can not be his favorite yet. He'll still go back to it, right? Like I, be... I mean, I just enjoy most food. So is it, is it salty? I feel like chocolate, sweet, and salt. You need you need saltiness. It's like the holy trinity. Just yeah. a little hint yeah, of it's salt. A, it's a bit. It's a bit salty. It has salt in there. Yeah, they probably That's put essential. French fry oil in it. Ew. <laughs> 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 so we got 48 minutes left of this chocolate milkshake review well, anything can, else you'd like to add Corey um you know that I will tell a story <laughs> when I was running the well I still am but when I was running an earlier iteration of the explication group you know we've been running this since 2012 but the uh, cyber forum for modernity. There was a point where there was a discrepancy between me and another leader of this group about how we wish we should go uh, because, it, you know, we've always attracted radicals and there were people there, very out, outspoken opinions. And my friend and I, Satchel, were debating as to whether we should start a new group to sort of cleanse it of its um, weirder aspects. And we decided that the way we would do this was through a joust, a jousting match. Uh, despite being in the horse capital of the world, uh, for our class, it was very difficult to acquire horses. <laughs> so what we uh, substituted in place were uh, humans. <laughs> his, his human steed was a, a man by the name of Tolan who went on to become a lawyer Huh? Yes. Well. Yes, in the Explication, yeah. explication yeah. Gospels. And my steed was a man by the name of uh, Truman, man of the true. And, <laughs> and Satchel claims to this day that his loss is purely on the basis of his steed. But I said, as any true knight knows, you know, read Don Quixote. A steed is important, but the man riding the steed is who determines the victory. In either case, I won the duel. We used hockey sticks uh, and fencing masks in place of uh, lances would be the provincial term. And (laughs) the typical attire of a knight, you know, as Don Quixote just finding the rusted attire of his uh, uncle or grandfather or whatever in in his space to uh, go on his adventures to the uh, hotel castle. But anyway, our hotel castle was literally White Castle. We went out to the White Castle for Lexingtonians who listen in on this. It was the White Castle in the Bryan Station area off New Circle. And we met up. It's a big parking lot, and we met up outside the parking lot And we uh, got on our mounts, our human mounts, and faced each other as the patrons of the Castle of White looked on in utter confusement. And uh, we rammed into each other, and uh, Satchel fell off, and I won. And I won the aspect of retaining explication as it was in the iteration of explication 3000 for another year after which i was like actually Sacha was probably right we need to kind of start this over and it became explication bellissimo but we had another year so the current iteration yeah so we had another year of it because of that duel outside of white castle so white castle has been very very uh influential 
to me in my personal history in that regard. Would you ever do another duel that same style? Yeah. Okay. Over the just reasons. Okay. Yeah, what type of reasons would you consider doing a White Castle duel? I guess well, is my question. It, yeah, I need it per se be out of White Castle, but a duel of any sort has to be something over something important of honor to be uh, lost uh, in the process, which is basically the direction of this group. Um, so something of a similar nature that had to deal with that um so it must be adversarial yeah adversarial among gentlemen adversarial among friends yeah the best sort of adversariness would you say honors involved as well well honors definitely involved how does that play into the duel though like what's really because the the duel is a enactment of an economy that takes place regardless of any other political sphere where the economy becomes entirely honor based and that is an economy that doesn't take into account currency or, in this case, who can or cannot afford horses in the horse capital of the world. It becomes a currency of one man's hockey stick to another um, and, and one man's human mount to another. And... Satchel can blame his mount all he wants. At the end of the day, it was my divine right to knock him off of his human mount with my hockey stick. And that is where the honor comes into play. What was your steed's uh, stud fee? What was what? Your your steed's stud fee. Stud fee? It was honor. Do you, was your steed studded? Yeah, do you know do you know what, like a stud is like when horse okay, never mind. We'll move on to a different question. We just yeah, so, so, yesterday so was the is, derby, I'll, wasn't I'll it? I'll actually ask you about this because this is very relevant to the derby. So one of the things that happens to the Kentucky Derby winner is they go then retire on a farm and for the next several years their stud is sold, which is their sperm, their semen. Mm -hmm. They basically yeah, they basically, the, the trainers remove it for the next years. Yeah, they're pimped out. What are your thoughts on that, the horse prostitution in Kentucky in a state? I can't like, say too much on this. What I can say is that I think, can, the thing is, is that there's 11 cities in the world that claim the title horse capital of the world. And I do have a particular opinion on this. Lexington's prior title was Athens of the West, and we were totally unique in claiming that title of a city. And my, my point is that the reasons for moving from that were pretty oligarchical and touristic. And if you really want to justify that claim, you actually have to live up to it in a way that is unique to the city. And the only way you can really do that I mean, Lexington has mounted police, but so does Canada. So who who cares, right? So it's like the only way you can actually live up to that, I think, is if you actually provide a tax incentive for owning only horses as a way to get about rather than cars. And what that would mean is that all the ghettos in Lexington, instead of tricking out their cars in the hood, would, would be talking about... Um, you know, like I tricked out my horse. I have this saddle made of bullets and peop saddle. people would have gang battles on horses rather than drive-by shootings. And you would trick out your horse, you know, shoes. And there'd be whole industries, not about tricking out your ride, uh, your car ride, but tricking out your horse, pimping out your horse. And I think Lexington should actually give tax incentives um, for horses so you don't have to have a license you know a two-year-old can ride a horse around town if they want to and you can't get a dui on a horse you can't get a dui on a horse and as long as you're on a horse it you applies a I'll, I'll address that in a second it applies as housing property therefore you can have a registered or non-registered gun on you as long as you're on your horse once you get off your horse you have to have a license to have an well, uh, i'm pretty sure that exists with cars right now but but you can't just like be outside of your car waving your gun. 
So you can be outside of your horse waving your Yes, gun? that's my point. So if you have a horse, so you can just be waving. The not really that applicable. Then. If you can be away from your horse and wave your gun. Then... No, you have to be on the horse waving your gun like a cowboy. But I'm saying I think you can do that in your Rootin car tootin'. right now. Can you do that in your car? It's an extension of, well, Nathaniel's our, our, our friend, but it's an extension of your home. So you're allowed to have a gun unlicensed in your home. You're also have, allowed to have a gun unlicensed in your but car. You can't just wave your but people car. get arrested for having unlicensed weapons in their cars all the time. Uh, well, I'm not, to be honest, very sure on the law here, but I would say there's uh, this is a, a case where the distinction between de jure and de facto is uh, relevant. Uh, so maybe in principle or in writing and law, uh, it's okay, but in in actual effect, probably not because it's uh, alarming. <laughs> but in either case, more importantly, you don't need any insurance on your on your horse because God is the insurer of horses. Sure, and th- this goes with with the DUI thing. So to answer your question, Nate, about not being able to get a DUI. I believe it happened in 2012 in Louisiana. There was a man who rode his horse to the bar and it was very late at night. He was very intoxicated and his horse was driving him home. And a policeman pulled over the horse and uh, gave him a ticket for a DUI and he told him he had to come to ticket? court. He gave the man a ticket. Okay. Um, but the man showed up to his court date and he insisted that he w- had not committed uh, driving under the influence because the horse was the one in control and the horse knew which way home was. Yeah. And the judge ended up ruling that that was the case. And uh, so now and, it's on, on a national level. All Wait, the on a national sh- level? Because you said Louisiana was a state court or federal court. And what law are they applying? I think this went up to the state court. Um, but like this and like this is applicable now. And like uh, Kentucky said similar. Oh, okay. Kentucky has had similar cases. Yeah. So, well, like the big one like people talk about in Kentucky is like the you can't have like an ice cream cone or whatever in like the back of your pocket because people would use it to steal horses. Because if a horse follows you, then obviously you're the owner and whatnot. And like there's there's such cases. Like, it's very weird. Many such cases. Sad. Maybe don't quote me on that, but... <laughs> In either case, also, the other thing is that all the main downtown streets of Lexington, um, for all days except Sabbath, should only be allowed to have horses on them. You cannot drive any cars whatsoever, any automobiles, anything running on electricity or oil on these streets. Only if you have a horse can you go down Main Street, North Limestone, South Limestone, uh, Broadway, and, you know, I think this would also solve a lot of traffic problems. The other thing is that it creates a lot of jobs because you have to have people who scoop the poop and then we can use the poop to fertilize trees uh, to grow fruit for the homeless. So I think it solves a lot of problems um, when we kind of come together as a city and get rid of cars. I mean, my point is, is like... If you're going to call yourself the horse capital of the world, you really have to show it because, again, there's so much competition. Or we just go back to calling ourselves Athens of the West and we spend 50% of the municipal fund to fund homeless philosophers in the in the street. But if you're not going to do that, then you have to spend that money towards uh, the horse thing. So it's like, you, yeah, you have to live with your name. Whatever, whatever thing a city is going to call itself, you really have to invest in it, especially something like Horse Capital of the World because there's so many competitors for that name. So you really have to show, you know, Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia, um, County Kildare in Ireland, um, Le Deville in France. You, all these cities claim to be horse capitals. So if you're going to do this, you have, to, you have to show your worth. And, you know, a lot of people say for Lexington, it, you know, we have the, the horse races. What are they called? Um, horse races, horse like races. Keeneland? Are you talking about Keeneland? Keeneland. Keeneland. Yeah. Okay. So they say, <laughs> you know, you get out of, the, you get, you touch down in the airport in Lexington, and it's you come out, and it's it's Keeneland right there in your face, which is like it's not even real. It's like a bunch of Illuminati, you know, child trafficking stuff. So it's like that's not even like the real horse stuff. But it's like if you, if you're really going to do it, you know, you have to you have to you have to live up to that pedigree. So you're saying you get out of the airport. And there are no Ubers. You call the horse. You call the horse, okay. right? Like basically, yeah. we, we don't just don't allow. You, you touch down, and you're like, oh, this must be the horse capital. Yeah, it's like if you okay. go to Egypt or you go to, um, you know, Mon- Mongolia. You there aren't really taxis. I'm being serious. You call like a you go to a, you go to a camel play like camel herder, 
And he's like, oh, do you want to rent a camel? And you give it to my brother over in uh, Al-Ghazali. And uh, he'll send me, you know, two kilos of cocaine. I don't and think you've ever been to Egypt. I've, I've been there spiritually. It's a little different. So, Kentucky, what do you say? Uh, go over there, give my brother two things of meth? Since Kentucky's... Something like that. Okay. Or horse bourbon. Poop. Bourbon. Horse poop there. or bourbon. <laughs> okay. In Egypt, it would be Why would you caught. give them horse caught poop? Is the because horse poop will be very valuable, like high grade. So instead of the horse semen, <laughs> it'll be the horse poop. Because you, you don't actually want the semen of the prime horse that wins the races. You want their poop. Because the, uh, the mindset is totally different. We're working on a total different new age mindset here. We're not trying to breed horse winners. We're trying to breed horse poopers. <laughs> 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 and the... And the manure, the manure of the horse, because it it breeds not new horses. I'm speaking platonically here. It breeds not new horses, but new fertile crops, which grow tobacco. really good tobacco. And and so that's the other thing, because Kentucky produces the most tobacco, it consumes the second most tobacco. What West Virginia produces the second most amount of tobacco, consumes the most tobacco. We're like sister states. In either case. It's you know that's that's kind of like the myth, the modern myth that people tell about Kentucky is that the reason our horses are so the bluegrass steroided is because of the bluegrass, but that's not true in my opinion because there's a lot of places the grass that could be <laughs> blue or red and it's like the horses they they say it's the limestone, but I don't buy it cuz there's limestone in lots of places and it's not like the grass is really going to make that much difference for the the bone structure of the horses. I mean, you listen to the pseudoscience of these people. They don't know what they're talking about. I think the actual reason, the actual scientific basis for why the horses are so strong here is because of the Nephilim bones that sleep into the soil. And that gets into the grass. And that's actually what causes Kentucky the horses. Kentucky biodynamy. Yeah. I was actually, watching, you know, Secretariat, right? Yeah. So average horse heart size eight to 10 pounds. His hor- his heart size was 22 pounds. Yeah, that's the Nephilim that, blood. So you don't think the limestone grass would make his heart that? That's something No, much that more. doesn't make any sense. I think every horse expert that says that is lying to you because I don't think they actually believe it. I always thought it had to do with the taste of the grass and the horses just really like the He's taste. He's really and, happy about the grass. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I He's guess like, you can attribute that to the same good thing. Grass. You know, I'm really honored to they be here the on the last Jacob episode of the, the uh, Minute <laughs> Hour. <laughs> Really an honor. Now, if we can circle back a little bit to the dueling, because I like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you think we should bring back dueling in society? Well, you know, I always appreciate Instead of like it. cancel culture dueling. I always appreciate it, Maryland, in this aspect. I like, I like the flag. I like the flag of Maryland. But there, a lot of states have like this bullshit, like state flower, state insect, state, um, you know, state dog. State dog. But Maryland has a state sport. A lot of states do, but Maryland in particular has a state sport. And their sport is uh, jousting. And you think about what jousting is compared to other modern sports. Like you go to a jousting match, you don't see all this advertisements about Coca-Cola or Bud Light or um, I don't know, whatever happens in sports nowadays. But it's just like the pure flag culture it's like oh this is like britain's flag and this is france's flag and this is maryland's flag and you know this flag sucks we're gonna burn it and so it's that's all it is it's pure it's pure blood it's pure essence there's no commercialism in jousting now on the other hand i fear that if jousting was brought back into outside of maryland like mainstream culture would probably get infected by this commercialism so i'm really divided over whether or not but that would be another thing with the whole horse culture like horse capital of the world it's like and so far we're going to do this like we're not doing the world horse olympics we're not going to do the bullshit with the derby and all this child trafficking what we're actually going to do is jousting and jousting with actual rods where people probably die and when that happens you can't just advertise bud light because like people's lives are at stake like who wants to advertise? What would you advertise? Well, you advertise the the spirit of blood, the spirit of honor. Like when when death gets involved, it's like the Mayan ball game, right? Where if you lose, the team captain gets his head chopped off. It's like when you're doing that, how can you in good faith advertise Bud Light? You could advertise tobacco. 
That's... But only in so far as like people are smoking, it's it's very high to Gary, and it's like if we're right, gonna... death is a possibility, right? Of being. Yeah, yeah, and you and you take enterprise over your your possibility of towards being towards death. So it's like if you're going to do that, it's like it's only in so far you're in the moment that you're doing that. You're or you're drinking Bud Light or you're smoking a certain tobacco. You're not going to put all these signs up, polluting the because sports are such a spiritual thing. And modernity has really lost that aspect of sports. Sports have become so commercialized. But what sports are really are is a matter of life and death and honor. And when you introduce all these advertisements, sports become a, a thing of celebrity status, not about the aspect of the spiritual revelation or the analogy that sports tell about life and death, which is how sports have functioned historically. But rather, they become a system of monetizing celebrity status and sort of just distracting people from things that actually matter, like life and death. But that's the exact opposite of what the role that sports played historically, which was actually to connect us spiritually to life and death. Sports were themselves a sacrifice, a living sacrifice uh, to the gods. And that included usually people dying in that process. So it's like, I'm not anti-sports. I'm just anti-sports that don't involve life and death. I think every sport should involve a very intense, likely possibility of death. Because only then do we actually start to take sports seriously as what they are actually supposed to be, which is an analogy of the cycle of birth and death and rebirth. So do you think we should bring back chariot racing then? Maybe yeah, as yeah, part definitely. of the I think, capital? I think the Byzantines were onto something. I think we need to... Um... NASCAR. Yeah, it's close enough, but this is the horse capital of the world we're talking yeah, about. Yeah, we're not the NASCAR capital. We're the horse capital. What if we did something like NASCAR, but with horses? So you have horses race around in a circle really fast. Do you mean the fucking <laughs> Kentucky Derby? <laughs> yeah, I think that's what we do. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about the... Um, you, you mentioned several times the uh, Keeneland's fake. It's uh, child trafficking. I don't think many of the listeners are really um, probably aware of that. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, so it's like in general throughout the world, if you're really rich, you know, whether or not you're involved in child trafficking bullshit, like the thing you're trying to do with art is like you're buying art so you can kind of like get rid of like a bunch of your income and do bullshit charity stuff so you don't pay taxes. So like horse racing is very similar. But the thing is with horse racing, at least in Lexington, like Lexington is kind of the capital of um, child trafficking. So like the Queen of England comes here, a bunch of celebrities come here. They all stay in the same, same hotel, you know, 21st century, whatever. And it's like you go there and you see the sort of Abramovic, Abramovic type of art you see in like MoMA. You know, when I was in New York City, I would go to MoMA and I see all these weird like child sexual position paintings. And then you go to the MoMA or you go to um, 21st century, see that sort of stuff. And they have these weird masquerades. Anyway, the, the thing is, is like Kentucky's always, or Lexington's always been this kind of like, like the World Economic Forum, they do all their weird stuff here. And um, they, what? Yeah, yeah, the World the world Economic Forum meets in Lexington every now and then, yeah. And uh, the World Economic Forum, you know, it, it's like I'm preaching to the, the choir because it's Davos. like, huh? It's, it's the new Davos. Well, it's like I'm preaching to the choir because anyone who understands what I'm saying knows what I'm talking about and anyone who doesn't is just going to pass me off but I mean I imagine most people listening to this podcast probably know what I'm talking about but well, it's the, like then the book came out recently like the mafia book um, what's it called Bluegrass like, Conspiracy Bluegrass Conspiracy well, yeah so like that, that kind of stuff is like out in the open mm -hmm. or whatever like it's not completely but it doesn't really talk about the child trafficking stuff okay and if you've been paying attention you know in Lexington at least since 2016 um, no sorry 2020 it was starting kind of in 2006, but especially 2020, around when Biden got elected, like the January, February, there's all these FBI cars everywhere because they're all trying to crack down on all the corruption and bullshit or whatever. And I don't exactly know the whole story. All I know is that Lexington's always kind of been like that capital in, Le in America for all the trial trafficking stuff. And something's going on with it now. But in, in either case, like, you know, Keeneland or the, the Super Horse Bowl or whatever it's called has always been sort of a face for all these celebrities just happening to come to Lexington and the World Economic Forum just, despite being a world managerial system, just happening to meet in Lexington, you know, just some hick county in the middle of Kentucky. When did the World Economic Forum meet in Lexington? I think the first meeting was in the 60s. You'll have to look it up because I'm not entirely sure on that. Where in Lexington? Seraphim, can you fact check real fast? Okay. I don't know exactly where I met in Lexington, no. I just, I, I, I don't know anything about this. Yeah, no, they met in Lexington, yeah. Okay. I was just going to ask about the 21C Hotel. 
There are a bunch of like blue penguins around that area. Do those mm-hmm. have any sort of symbolics? That's a that's an artist. A lot of that was like Jim Gray. He was okay. really into the blue penguin thing and uh I don't I don't know much about it. Okay. I don't know that much about the artist well, behind 21C it. Tony One C actually began in Louisville, uh not in Lexington. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think uh, the blue penguin is sort of their icon. So mm. that would have been a Louisville thing. In either case, when Jim Gray became the mayor of Lexington, he really uh, pushed that blue penguin thing forward. I don't know anything about it personally. Okay, so you were kind of comparing your... You, you were kind of talking about how you, you thought modern sports should be um, bringing up the dueling. And do life wanna, and death in particular. Yeah, so do you want to... Like team so, captains have to be sacrificed if they lose. Yeah. So do you want to delve more into that about maybe what sports was like in antiquity and and what it's like now and what the change what change may have come like why it's different? Yeah. I mean, sports sports are sort of a universal phenomenon, but again, they were understood. I mean, so that there's a difference. You have to separate the game from sports. So the game was something that connected people in a way that was metaphorical. But it was metaphorical in a more esoteric sense. So like you were into chess, you started to master chess, you start realizing that chess is based on mathematical equations that are in themselves based on esoteric ideas of Pythagorean uh, ideas about reality. And you start to get initiated through the game. So the game kind of acts as like a, a, a hook and, and pull uh, to initiation. So the actual game what the Ludi, the in and of itself, you know, if you're interested in this, read Master Sir Ludi by, uh, um, who wrote Siddhartha? Hesse, Herman Hesse. Um, that the games themselves were a property of initiation. Now, when you got into the real serious business, you had sports in the sense of the Olympics, for example, or the Mayan ball game, which were all analogical and metaphorical to the revolution of the calendar cycle. And in the Mayan culture, or the cycle of sacrifices to Zeus. And the idea is that the very strength and virtue that was composed into manifesting a hero of sportsmanship uh, in, in the Olympic tradition became in and of himself a sacrifice to Zeus and to the gods. And so the idea here is that the, the virtue that emanates in the body, the perfection of the body, the aesthetic of the body, is mirroring the virtue of the perfection of virtue towards the gods in the abstract sense. But uh, with with a lot of cultures, there was this very imminent uh, reality of life and death that was involved in. So where Olympic sports are more usually individual, um, the sports of, say, like a Mayan ball court game, which we might compare to, say, basketball in today, that actually had a life and death situation. If you were the captain of a team in a big event and you lost, you were sacrificed to the gods. And, and this wasn't even per se a dishonorable thing, which was the aspect of sports that preserve honor and honor economy and honor culture. And, and so here we have the idea of sports as a way to regulate the economy of honor. Um, or you can take, say, the sportsmanship of feudalism in, say, the West or uh, courtly love of Aquitaine, France, or, say, uh, the shogunate in Japan with uh, samurai culture and samurai honor culture where you would have a, a sword battle, not over any immediate political reason, but merely as a, a system of honor. And so, or, you know, I guess a more modern degenerate form would be what we might be more used to in the American context would be like a Western wild, wild West shooting where it's like, I'm not shooting this other guy for any overt political reasons, but merely as a system of, you know, this talent isn't big enough for two of us sort of thing. So in, in either case, it was an idea of like, we are emanating the aspect of the rivalry of the gods themselves through a manifestation of sportsmanship. So sportsmanship, it's always, it always struck me as weird when you learn about sportsmanship growing up because it seems so lame. It's like, oh, you have to like be nice to the person you won against or lost to. But that doesn't make any sense. Like, why? What's the point? But actually, the deeper aspect of sportsmanship was emanating an honor code for the masses. Like, not everyone can be a swordsman. Not everyone can be a, a jouster. Not everyone can be a mind ball court person. So the sports were an emanation of something higher that were getting to the hoi polloi, was getting to the masses, this uh, way of tribalistically attaching yourself to a, a team or an idea in, in the cycle of the gods. Whereas now it's been commercialized under capitalism, you're not attaching yourself to something transcendent, but you're attaching yourself to something very immediate and superficial and individualistic, like the celebrity culture of modern sports, or even something like the, the pure... Facsimile or the pure purity of 
uh, supporting a team or rooting for a team and painting yourself in the tribal colors of that team that has absolutely no transcendence attached to it whatsoever. Um, it's merely pride without any actual correspondence. I, I was just going to say, it's interesting because it does seem like uh, loyalty to sports teams is sort of one of the last... Vestiges. Yeah, of 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 that. I mean, I, I we, we talk a lot about like fashion kind of identi identity as fashion and the way people use like politics, like, you know, you know, MAGA, Black Lives Matter, you know, LGBT, whatever, uh, as sort of these like fashion statements to kind of signal some sort of identity about yourself. But those things, at least they all have some sort of substance that in theory, or in theory, some substance, um, you know, that means something in, in, in the world in a greater context. Whereas, I think, yeah, one of the last vestiges is sports where it's like there, it actually has no meaning and people at least know that, but people get very, very tied into their their teams and um, their players. And to the point of, I mean, you see, uh, you, you do see in America, I know you see it definitely like in, in England with certain of their like uh, soccer, football um, rivalries where, I mean, people will get violent or they'll start to, you know, cause you know riots or whatever because of certain results uh, and it's so interesting that people will get that obsessed about something that everyone would at least understand like they would at least admit oh that actually has no real meaning in yeah. the world it's so interesting how that still exists well it's, it's the same thing i say with the, the covid hysteria it's a it's a remnant or an allowance that is politically potentialized and an allowable of uh, religious zealotry. But even and, with COVID, you can at least have the, ex like you could at least think to yourself, oh, well, this actually means something. Well, I don't and, think and, anyone's and, tricking and here, himself and here's, into and here's the analogy of saying, well, something. here's my point though. When you look at sports, it's not religion per se, but nonetheless a vestige of nationalism that is no longer accrued in modernity. And another example to this too is the aspect of why people get into things like uh, Lord of the Rings or fantasy. And the reason is because it allows us a permission uh, of escape, of escapism to a very natural uh, tendency of what we now in modernity call racism, uh, which it, which is basically just a very, whatever any other tradition would have just seemed as being. Again, it wasn't racism based on race in the way modernity thinks about like blacks versus white versus Asian. It was much more political in the, in the true sense of the etymology of that word of the police. So when Plato is talking about the superiority of Athens, of Athenians. He's not talking about the superiority of the Greeks, although he would very much stand behind that. He's talking about the superiority of Athenians uh, over that of the Spartans. And in so far, the Spartans are inferior to Athenians or whatever. I'm being facetious here. But it's it's that they in themselves, and so far there's the Greek identity, are superior to the Scythians, who are superior to the Egyptians. So it's not it's not like a white thing. It's like even the French think they're superior to everyone else, and the British think they're superior to everyone else. So we can no longer really entertain that in any conscious ethical way. So what we do is we externalize that to something that has no political harm, which becomes uh, this uh, entrenchment within fantasy of things like elves and dwarves and humans and blah, blah, blah. Likewise, sports function as that natural vestitude of uh, psychically energizing ourselves with a nationalism that we can no longer tolerate in modern culture. And so we cannot say we are true Athenians or we are true Frenchmen. We say our football team <laughs> is better than this. And so by winning, I have conquered and vanquished. And this was the idea of the Olympics too, is that the gods have favored us to prosper under Pax Romana or, or under peace. So instead of going to war, we will vanquish our enemies through sport. But that whole analogy has been lost in modernity because it's become industrialized and commercialized and capitalized. So now it's merely this um, egoistic identification through celebrity that we have in most media with uh, film or, or Hollywood, but with the, with the, I don't know, sports people, but uh, Brian Manning, is that a sports person? No, Peyton Manning. Peyton, Peyton Manning. Manning. Good, good try. And, and all these, uh, or Socrates, the football guy and, all, and so on. So there's identification of hero worship, but it's, it's degenerated into a pure non-transcendent reality that is manifested empirically in a person. Sure. And that going back to the Olympics thing, that's, this is a point I wanted to touch on, is you have this distinction, I feel like, in the ancient world between athletica, athletics, 
and um, you know, like the sportsmanship where you have, like you were saying, this very life and death like experience going on here, uh, where there's honor on the line. There's no way to really like advertise it ever. It's all about the colors. It's all about the flags. Mm-hmm. Whereas, like with Athletica, um, especially in the modern world, I feel like that's really been um, adopted by consumer capitalism because that's something that is very safe to attribute brands to. That is something that's very safe to market, and especially in a, uh, you know, like modern America or whatever, where you have people who obsess over fitness or people who obsess over fashion and whatnot. Um, it's very appealing to have this very watered down form of sportsmanship that is really no more than glorified athletics um, when you boil it down to it. Um, going back to, say, like the identification with fantasy um, or like Lord of the Rings or Warrior Cats, whatever whatever subgenre you want to tie into, I think that while it's very true that people have used this kind of as a way to form identity, um, that as a way that's not politically incorrect or whatnot, I think there's also something much deeper there in that we've destroyed our origin myths. We've destroyed yeah. our ability to tie with something um, purely based on the notion that, oh, well, it may not have actually happened that way. We can't prove factually or we can't prove materially that things happen exactly as they did in this story. And so people have had to detach themselves from these origin myths that we've had for centuries, that we've had for entire civilizations um, that define the morals, that define the characteristics, that define the purpose of these different groups within civilization. Um, the the table of nations, if you even want to go back to that, like that's all been kind of destroyed. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think, I think they go hand in hand together, you know, in that uh, you have like identity reemerging um, in a different form. Um, it's not something that can be completely destroyed, but it's very different and um, contrasted from the ancient identity um, of like honor and glory that you'd find in um, sportsmanship. So yeah. I was going to ask you, we're talking about sports kind of, oh, we, we're not going to invade them in war. We're going to beat them in sports. Where would now fantasy sports are very popular, where it's not a team that's real. It's you make your team and compete against your friends. What would be the, the reason that's so popular? Well, it's kind of like what Baudrillard talks about in Simulacrum and Simulation, where we start with the reality, uh, and then we take an abstraction of the reality that is representational of the reality. And then we have an abstraction of the abstraction that only bears resemblance and images to that reality. And then we get the fourth marker, which is a total abstraction that has nothing to do with the original, to the point that the copy becomes in the mindset of the many as the actual original. And what you see with that in the aspect of sports is that the original is the divine battle in the heavens before the creation of, of the earth or Ragnarok or Armageddon. And sports is a recreation of that so if you look at the um, uh, the Romanian author, I'm trying to remember his name. Um, thank you, Mr. Lati. So his his understanding of all human rituals pre modernity is a recreation of the eternal cycle of reality into the everyday life. So everything pre modern man does was an attempt to bring the eternal down into this immediacy, um, and to therefore unite our soul to the divine. And what happens with sports in the immediate uh, representation, the representation of that aspect, is that sports are this bringing down of the honor class of the gods to the everyday manifestation of the human polis and the human reality in, in human culture. So that's the first level. And then the third level here would be the representation of the representation, which would be like modern day sports would have become abstracted from that abstraction of dealing with um, celebrity culture and materialism and advertisement. And so the next abstraction, this is where we're reaching the total simulacrum for Baudrillard, or let's say the Kali Yuga or the end of the end times, uh, where we're actually approaching the abstraction of the abstraction of the abstraction to the point that there's one, that we can no longer differentiate between the originally a copy. And so we are not totally there yet because we can still look at fantasy sports and say that this is different than manifest sports that we're still used to. But there will, uh, with Baudrillard's uh, prophecy, let's say there will be a point where we can't differentiate that anymore. So what would that look like? Well, I guess like we're all plugged into the VR system and we no longer have any differentiation between that reality and this one. And it's all VR sports, right? That's the only thing we live for, like esports and gaming sports and people playing the Dota or whatever. So at that point, 
we 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 we're no longer even in an abstraction of the honor code system of what sports were meant to be. We've entirely abstracted from even that abstraction. So, you know, um, if I mean, you kind of said this a little bit earlier with the dueling, but if they were to come up to you for some ungodly reason, Corey, and say, Corey, we want you to fix the NFL. How would you do the next Super Bowl? You know, like what what would you do to American sports? Let's just say the NFL to make it. You're the I new would, Roger Goodell. I don't know who these are, but I would get rid of all the advertisements. No, no advertisements allowed. Um, I don't know how much these things function at the moment. Um, I would say there is no photography or filming of these events. You have to go there to witness it. If you're not there, you only hear it by word of mouth. That would be my second thing. So no uh, halftime shows or whatever, any of this bullshit. Um, also, there is religious ceremony surrounding it. So for America, that's very much a Masonic, Satanic sort of sacrifice that happens, which I guess is already the halftime show, but in a, in a more honest way. <laughs> um, and uh, so that happens. Uh, but again, you only hear word of this. There's no television or anything or radio about it. And so you have to, uh, you know, I don't know how you get into these events. Is it like a golden ticket sort of you thing? You buy tickets. You yeah. buy tickets. Well, I don't like the buying system. I guess I would have, you have to battle everyone who wants to be in it and whoever lives gets to be in it. Like a jousting match to get tickets? To death. It has okay. to be something to death. To get tickets? So you can be in it, yes. No, no, I mean, not to be in it, but to like be a Yeah, to participate, yeah. As because a Because it's a great honor to witness the unfolding of divine revelation. It sounds like to have this, we would actually have to basically destroy America. It couldn't be well, that's fine America with me, but in America. either case, <laughs> in either case, I think I think one thing well, you have to wouldn't consider. Wouldn't we run out of fans though? Well, if, here's the thing. 16, here's 17, the thing 18 most 18 people don't season. consider. I think very, <laughs> and I wish Jonathan is here because I think he would totally agree with me. But I think very few people of so-called sports fanatics would actually participate in this, knowing they'll probably die. So kind of like a Hunger Games situation. Um, and then they take all the people they can fit in the stadium. I don't know. Is that like 10,000 or something? It's like 80,000, 80, 80 think they'll, I don't think, I don't think they'll fill out past 10,000. I think less than 10,000 people will participate. So whoever wins those to the death matches, they get to be participants. And then um, the losing team has to sacrifice the captain. Is there captains in these things? Kind of. Like probably the best player or quarterback. So the quarterback has to be sacrificed but in an honorary way, it's not like a shameful thing. So is it's he a, killed? Yes, oh, but it's okay. it's a great it's a great honor, even though you're losing. See, this is the true meaning of sportsmanship. Yes, being a victor is in of itself a great strength. It's a great honor, but being losing uh, is also a great victory because you are a living sacrifice to the gods, and so your body is burnt up as an, a sweet smelling offering to the gods of sportsmanship, um, and everyone cheers and feasts on the blood. And the body of the of the sports uh, quarterback, Nickelback, the guy, <laughs> the guy who is sacrificed to the gods, and and all the participants who uh, get to watch the the game get to feast in a communal meal, and then they tell stories and write poetic edits of it and spread it to the masses of Washington D.C. and Boston. Do you think you could sustain thirty two teams, eighteen week seasons, or do you think that you would have to shrink the season down? Well, again, whoever is willing to make that sacrifice deserves to be in it. I don't know how how many, I don't keep up well with sports enough to know whether or not the people currently participating in sports are the type that would be willing to make that sacrifice. But if they're true people of sport, they should be, I yes. I feel like you would have to narrow down uh, the sports. I don't think we'd have like 20 different sports teams in a city. I think it would end up being like you have a single sport in very large cities. That yeah, there should very much be a national sport. Yeah, I feel like golfing would die pretty quickly. Yeah, golfing would be out there. Well, the golf, golf, uh, golfing actually, interestingly, is one of the more traditional sports around. And I'll say this, golfing has an interesting exception to these rules because it is still abiding by a very cosmically and, 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 and a logically uh, esoteric system that doesn't require the sacrifice in the way that most other sports do. But I don't want to get too much into golfing right now, actually. But that's a whole nother game. Do you golf? My curiosity. What? You've piqued my curiosity. With golfing? Yes. So golfing is a, is a cosmic uh, analogy or allegory of the platonic system of how the stars uh, relate to the sun. 
And the what the Scottish were picking up on was this divine system that was coming out of Neoplatonism. And this idea of how the whole in one represents the total un- uniqua- uh, univocacity of being and the relationship between... So enlightenment is a process where you don't have any mediumship between the whole and yourself. And so the union is without any mediation. It is the whole in one. Um, what you're doing is setting yourself up in the perfect state of Zen meditation, so to speak, to where the access to that whole has... Actually, very similar to archery. If you want a very good book on sports and philosophy, uh, Herschel's Zen and the Art of Archery is a very good book on this. But it's basically the same principle esoterically in golf. And what you're doing with games like golf or archery, they don't require sacrifice for the reason, one, there are one-player games, sort of like the Olympics. Um, So again, in the Olympics, it doesn't require the sacrifice bodily. That's only in things that are versus like teams or things like that. Well, you go against someone in golf. Would I? Well, no, typically you go against other people in golf. But but it's different. It's the same thing in archery. Like, can you go against someone else in archery? Okay, so yes. you're saying because there's no, like, defense or something. But what you're okay. really going against, okay. even when you're going against someone else in archery, even when you're really going against someone else in golf. You're going against yourself. The outer jihad is just a reflection of the inner jihad, which to an extent <laughs> is true in all sports, but it's especially true with things like archery and golfing. Okay. The enemy is actually a distraction, whereas the enemy, it, it's much more Sun Tzu when you're doing things like, I guess, football or, or soccer, in the sense that your enemy is an integral factor to victory. What you're doing in archery or golf is on a whole nother playing field. Your enemy is, is non-existent. True victory is not something over your enemy, but it's a victory over yourself. Again, this is also true in things like football or uh, soccer, but not in the same way. The enemy is not an integral factor to your success. There is no sense in which your enemy in archery or golfing, even though you're facing against their score, has anything to do with you conquering yourself. Whereas in football, you have to consider the strategy of your opponent as an integral aspect to your success and victory. So that's the that's the key difference, and that's where the sacrifice enters into the playing field. But but golf and, and things like archery are on a whole nother level. Though, don't get me wrong, both of those have, well, especially golf, have been also tyrannized by industrialism and capitalism, commercialism to the same degree, but in, in different quality of aspect. I, my, my point is that if you do what I was saying with football, what I just described, or whatever sport I was talking about, um, all that commercialization with golf and archery would fall uh, out to the wayside as well. Okay, but what if someone just says, Corey, we don't want to have a death match to watch football. Then you shouldn't have sports. But, well, sports, but- sports demand sacrifice. If you, I, I'm all for not having sports. I'm all for a society that doesn't have sports. Like, believe me. But my point is, it's like what I say with democracy. I'm not a Democrat. But if you're going to do democracy, you need to have free speech. I know a lot of people don't like that nowadays. And I'm saying, I'm on your side. I don't like free speech either. But if you want to do democracy, which you claim you do, you need to have this. Likewise, I don't really like sports, okay? They're not my thing. But if you're going to do this, you need to have the element of sacrifice. Otherwise, sports become a medium of nihilism. What? Well, yeah, nihilistic masturbation. They become distraction. Okay. If, you're, if you're going to do sports at all, this is an absolute necessity. The purest sport you can do is hunting. It is the most natural aspect in which man attains his divinity through the sacrifice of the animal that he stalks and hunts and consumes its flesh. That is the most primal, true sportsman thing you can do. But if and when society begins to evolve beyond that, that aspect of its culture. It needs to retain that aspect and it needs to still have that relationship to the divine. And so they invent games and sports. And once you do that, you need to maintain that spirituality. But the only way you can do that is when the stakes are high. Once you take away those stakes, it was the same thing we do with our food industry where we take away the actual killing and slaughtering of the animal personally. Once you take that away, you're you're robbing it of its spiritual importance. And so if you're going to do sports, like in my perfect society, everyone's just hunting. But if you're not doing that, if you want to do the sports thing, you need to retain the sacrifice. If you don't have the sacrifice, it becomes nihilism. We should bring back fox hunting. Yeah. That would be a perfect Kentucky sport, actually, with the horse industry. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What about horse hunting? 
I would be interested in that. That, uh, that kind of defies the totemism. What do you mean? Like riding a horse to kill a horse? Like if you're like to me, like if the horse is the sacred animal of Kentucky, that's not something you'd go around hunting. That's not. Oh, you're making killing. a Freudian point. Uh, yeah, I yeah. drink the blood. We have to have a uh, like. I mean, well, I don't want to say this. We have to have a fest, uh, <laughs> a festival, a festival where once a year we do consume the horse in a very sacred aspect, but otherwise you're yeah. never allowed to even touch the horse. Yeah, the Mongols drink horses' blood, or at least that's what Genghis Khan had his. I don't know troops. I guess you would call them when they are traveling, like across the Silk Road or whatever. If they're out of food or whatever, they would drink the blood of the horses mm-hmm. they rode. But I think in, in Mongolian culture, the the totem animal was actually the the eagle, the hawk. Yeah, they had because the hawks. It, it brought up spirits to heaven. But they wouldn't hunt the hawks, though. They no, would, you don't yeah. hunt the spirit animal. It's the sacred yeah. spirit yeah. animal. Yeah. Unless you go for this, like, sort of, this is kind of where I was going earlier when I, before I cut myself off, but like, for example, in uh, Roman culture, um, the elites would drink the blood of winning gladiators because the idea was you would drink the blood of a strong man to attain mm-hmm. basically his life force, right? And this is part of what's so symbolic and significant, symbolically significant about, um, for example, drinking the blood of Christ because then you partake yes. of the life of God. Yes. Um, and so I think in that sense, it actually makes a lot of sense to drink the blood of a totem. Yeah, right? Right. Because- or, or the, the losing victor. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, we have reached the end of the 50-minute hour. The last episode. The last episode. <laughs> or the first episode <laughs> season of season two. two. <laughs> this was a good way to kick it off. <laughs> Any closing remarks, anyone? Please don't give up on us. Um. To be the victor if you can, but understand there are great, great consequences to winning. <laughs>